All right, ladies and gentlemen, our headliner for this evening, you know him, you love him, Captain Randy Kramer. Put your hands together. What's up, Clip Clops? How you doing? That was a question. How you doing? Thank you very much. Thanks for hanging out. I appreciate that. We don't get to see each other anymore. So thanks for hanging out with me. I appreciate that. Uh, well, that's cool. So uh, we're going to talk about a subject that is one of my favorites. So psionics is a sciency word that we use for your mind purse. All right. And for about the last 10 years, I've been doing my very best to try to convince people to use that word instead of that other word. And the reason we don't like the other word is baggage. It's archaic. It's, it sounds way too old school, can I be honest? So let's remind ourselves that math and science are how everything functions. When we have conversations with other species, one of the things that our smartest people always ask their smartest people, I say, look, I got one question. If there's one thing that you want us to know, what is that? And they all say the exact same thing. The only thing that you do not know is the math and the science that you have yet to understand. Straight up. So psionics is based on laws of physics. Your brain and your mind work in a concerted effort to produce mind waves, right? This manifests all kinds of interesting things. But the important factor is when you understand the fundamentals of the way that the brain works, the way that the science of the physics of the mind work, what stage of states of consciousness are based on the understanding of brain waves and brain wave patterns, then you start to understand that amplitudes are what matter. So a lot of people like to use words like frequency and vibration. Stop it. Till you take a physics class, stop using physics words to describe things that aren't physics. It's what's wrong with this species and it makes me angry. It's a little bit, all right? Stop saying things you don't understand. Okay? Can I just be honest about that? Really sticks in my craw. Frequency is not what you want to amplify. Frequency is not what you want to raise. Vibration is also not what you want to raise. It's also not what you want to increase. Amplitude is what you want to increase. Okay? Amplitudes are what gets you the effect that you want. So when we talk about what are we trying to achieve, I would appreciate it if you say amplitude, because it's that's the correct thing when we talk about physics. It's not frequency, it's not vibration, it's amplitude. And it turns out that amplitude matters because everything that is measurable in psionic outputs, which is scientifically measurable, is measurable in something we call scions per second. So there's a measurement system. And what we find is that most abilities to occur have a threshold, have a scions per second threshold, have an output threshold. Perfect example, telekinesis, to move an object that's, let's say, a, a toothpick in a near frictionless environment, okay? That requires somewhere between about 10 and 15 scions per second to make that move, right? So if you're practicing on an object that you can't make move, it's because you're not producing enough amplitude. Not because you're doing it wrong, because you're not producing amplitude. Now, it turns out that it's not rocket surgery to figure out how to make more amplitude. I will go into some more detail about the practical aspects when I do a workshop on Sunday. So we'll do a little bit more like I will explain it in a way that is more personally relatable. But at this moment, we're just going to kind of chat about it for a minute. There are fundamental steps that 
you have to start with. And your brain is the most fundamental step that you start with because it's what houses everything. And often people do not understand all the, other than amplitudes, the precursor to amplitudes is how do you get to amplitudes, right? Well, step one is with your brain. So your brain is rewiring itself multiple times a nanosecond, in case you didn't know that. So everything you think, everything you say, everything you do, everything you watch, everything you listen to is telling your brain to rewire itself nanoseconds, multiple times a nanosecond. So as a very wise friend of mine once said, you get good at whatever you practice. If you practice being lazy and watching TV, I guarantee you're going to get good at being lazy and watching TV. Like you could be the gold medalist of lazy TV ass watchers if you wanted to be, right? If you want to really focus on that. Or you can focus on anything else you want to put time, energy, practice into and you get good at it. So every time you do something, you're practicing for your brain. Whether you want to or not, whether you think you are or not, you're practicing and telling your brain, rewire yourself, brain. So the first fundamental thing is teaching people how to rewire their brain. Because your brain is a vessel. And in order to hold the capacity that your mind is going to have to do to get the amplitudes that you need to have, your brain vessel has to be adequately structured to house the mind. Which, let me check a second. So the brain is the most fundamental part to start with. How do you rewire your brain? And the answer is with practice. Practice, 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 practice. One of the things I teach my students is the most fundamental is that if you want to have a disciplinary practice for psionic development and self-mastery, you don't do it by practicing once a week. You don't do it by practicing twice a week. You don't do it by practicing three times a week, or four, or five, or six. Something you do every day. Every day, every day, every day, every day, every day, every day, every day. If you don't want to suck, you do it every day. Ask a concert violinist, right? You know, why do you practice every day for hours a day? Because I don't want to suck, right? So anything you want to be good at, you have to practice every day. So putting that fundamental practice every day is also part of what makes the spiral go up, right, of development. Because development is actually a spiral. It's not like a line. It's a spiral. So development kind of goes like this. And every day you're developing, you're developing. And if you stop, and you stop long enough, and you start backtracking, you go back. Now, not always back to where you were, depending on who you are and what your bad habits are. And at most points, you go back to where you go, oh, shit, I backslid again, dang it. And then you do it again. And sometimes you go up and down and up and down. That's development. I don't know any person that's like, I'm developing myself with perfection every day and I never fail. I've never seen anybody do that. And anybody who says they're doing it, such a liar. Such a liar if they say they are. <clears throat> so the development process you want to make go every day, right? So you go up, not down. But it's not something that just because you miss time that you can't go back up. But it's a process that you want to climb upwards. So this is why every day, every day, every day. So by training the brain every day, you're making the vessel of your mind, of your brain, to hold your mind larger, capacity-wise. So then when we get to what your mind is doing, your mind is essentially broken down into sets of brain waves, if you really want to talk about what your mind and your brain are doing at the same time. So you have... There are five, five brain wave states, but we're not going to talk about the fifth one because it's superfluous at the moment, we'll talk about the four that matter. So you have four states of brain waves, which are identified by frequencies in hertz, which identify which range they're in. So you start at the lowest at delta waves, which are your sleep waves. If you've ever been asleep, you've experienced delta waves. They typically are between about a half and about three hertz. So theta waves are on top of that. They're a little, moving a little faster, somewhere sort of between about four and, depending on which scale you're looking at, eight and a half, maybe almost nine hertz. Alpha states, which is the next brain wave up, is between sort of about 13 and 18 hertz. 
And then beta waves are 18 to about 30, is about as high as they go. So beta waves are the easiest. So right now, your beta waves are moving around because you're listening to me talk and you're awake. And if you closed your eyes, you relaxed a minute, and you started breathing really slow, and chilling out. You started to see little colors in your eyelids, and little flashes happening. That's a sign that alpha waves are happening, right? So there's signs, indicators of what's happening. Alpha waves means you're dropping down from beta, down a little lower. But we really want to do for what we call actual meditative states, you want to get into a theta state. Now, theta states are your subconscious mind. So when you're in a theta state, the experience is pretty much like a lucid dream. So you might have an experience of being somewhere or experiencing something that is not where you are if you're actually sitting on a chair somewhere. But if you're doing it right, because you're maintaining some beta activity, you're still conscious during the process. And so you can be aware of what's happening instead of just being in a random floaty dream state, right? So theta states are really the important place for what's happening in your brain because that's where you access your subconscious. Difference between your subconscious and your conscious brain. They're in, in your mind, sorry, your subconscious and conscious. They're in the same brain, right? So it's not like your subconscious occupies a different brain than your conscious mind does, right? So they're in the same place but they don't really occupy the same area when it comes to activity and that has to do with that frequency, right? Never mind, that's just me. So um, you're, where was I? Now I got distracted. Theta waves, is that what I was talking about? Okay, subconscious, oh, thank you. Okay, subconscious states, conscious states. Thank you, it's been a long day. So your subconscious states, our meditative states, uh, our, our REM dream states, lucid dream states, where you experience a kind of conscious activity of something happening that's mentally virtual. So the subconscious and the conscious mind occupy the brain. They're in the same space, but they have different capacity. Best way to explain this is if you were to get an IQ test and say your IQ is 118. Not too shabby, not too good. All right. That's your conscious brain IQ. That's your beta IQ. Your theta IQ is several hundred points higher. Do I need to repeat that? Your subconscious mind's IQ is several hundred points higher than your beta brain's IQ. So when you're in a subconscious state, you're actually smarter than you are right now. So that's why we call it the super brain. And sometimes we call the beta brain the stupid brain because it's kind of stupid sometimes. It is, let's all be honest. We can admit that our beta brain does stupid things, it thinks stupid thoughts, it encourages us to do stupid things, make stupid choices. Don't it make me think that you're all like never making mistakes now. Nod your head. Oh, my beta brain does stupid things. I make mistakes. Yeah, yeah. We all do. Okay. Your beta brain forgets things. Your beta brain has to work really hard to process spatial information, mathematical information. It's so hard to think stuff. But your theta brain, it's effortless. Super smart, right? So wouldn't it be cool if your beta brain like was on more than your beta brain was? That sounds cool, right? Sounds impossible. No one's ever done it before. It's totally possible, right? So the trick understanding this is something called your alpha bridge, right? Which is the waves in between your beta and your theta, your alpha bridge. So what happens is when you're looking at a brainwave chart or brainwave EEG, you have these amplitudes in your alpha waves that are usually really tight, we call it a bottleneck. And that bottleneck means there's not free flowing information between your subconscious and your conscious brain. So all the effort that you put into in stretching out that alpha bridge increases the flow of information from your subconscious to conscious. Not hard, right? The trick is if you want that to actually happen, 
you have to do it every day, 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 every day. And then what happens is that little alpha bottleneck, it starts to widen up and widen up and widen up. And then pretty soon you've got this free flow of information between your subconscious and your conscious brain. Which then means that your beta brain can start communicating with your subconscious brain when it feels stupid about something and goes, oh, let me ask my subconscious. And your subconscious probably has the answer. Your subconscious probably knows or has a pretty good idea of where you should go from there. Right? So it's not rocket surgery. Again, it's pretty straightforward. But I find very disappointingly, that most people who teach meditation techniques um, teach a breathing technique or a visualization technique. Not that those are bad. We do breathing techniques. We do visualization techniques. They're cool. But without understanding the fundamental of what you're doing, why you're doing it, what's happening with your brain, your mind, and your brain waves, you're really wandering around blind. What am I doing? What am I doing? I can't see anything. Because you're taking a couple of steps that some people can make work, but a lot of people can't, to be honest with you. A lot of people, you give them a couple of steps that some people can follow, and other people are like, oh, I'm lost. And that's okay. And that's because people are dumb. People are really dumb. If you doubt that, let me give you a little piece of factual mathematical information. So 100 IQ is average, right down the middle, average. It means half the population is above 100, and the other half the population is under 100. You following me? That's, that's in this country alone, that's like you know over 125 million people that are kind of stupid. Good news, there's a cure for stupidity. And that's your subconscious brain, right? Your smarter part of your brain. That's the cure for stupidity. So it doesn't really matter where you're at on that scale. The more you develop brain self-mastery, mental self-mastery, brainwave self-mastery, you're increasing your brain's capacity. You're increasing memory, increasing IQ, increasing less stupid, which we all want. We all would like more less stupid, right? Is it that late in the day? Are we that tired? Is it that bad? Do I need to like, uh, uh, fart jokes? I got some, I mean, all right, maybe not. I'm saving for later. So, brain, brain waves, understanding that is where I get my students to start the final process of brain development and self-mastery. Because with that brain development and self-mastery, with the daily, daily practice, that does something that we call work out your psionic brain muscle, right? Which I like to compare to um, a baby arm. If you've ever watched an infant in a crib trying to move around, their arms flail in all directions, right? They can't control which direction it's going. They don't can't up, down, left, right. They don't know what's happening, right? But they're moving it like crazy so that they can get some muscle development and eventually be able to hold objects, lift things, point at stuff, right? It's a process. So the psionic muscle part of your brain is like that baby arm, okay? And it doesn't know what it's doing. And every time you're exercising it, you're really just flailing a baby arm all around the place. If you manage to do anything successfully, it's almost completely random because that muscle has no control. It has no focus. It has no strength. It can't get the amplitudes necessary to do the things that we would consider active psionic self-mastery. So you work that arm. You work that brain muscle every day, every day, every day every day and eventually it gets strong and you can do things with it so the beginning step process is learning what's happening with your noggin learning what's happening with your thinkings and learning what's happening with the process of how you tell yourself how to make your brain waves do what you want to do so it develops in the direction that you want so that you rewire your brain so that you re-encode your genetics so that you have the actual ability to do things that are superhuman. Oh, I'm sorry, is that too boring for you? 
no, no one, no one wants superhuman psionic abilities. Okay, I'm wasting my time. I'll see you later. All right, I'm out. I'm out. Of here. You know, all right. Seriously, all right. Who doesn't want psionic superpowers? Anybody? No. All right, but what if you had to work really, really, really hard to get them? Worth it? Hell yeah, it is. Totally worth it. It's worth the time every day. It's worth the effort every day. Takes a minute to like get the ball rolling most of the time when people first start out, but the impacts of what you start to experience internally and externally start to demonstrate that something's happening. And I encourage my students to set a very, 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 very low bar for themselves of what they think success is supposed to be. Because we often have this idea when we look at, oh, I can do that. That's no problem. That's pretty basic, right? I can do that. Uh, until you meet yourself and you start to disagree with yourself and argue with yourself, sabotage yourself, do all kinds of stupid things. Now, said the conscious brain was the stupid brain. What's wrong with the subconscious brain? Well, the subconscious brain's not the stupid brain, but it's the traumatized brain. It's the toddler, it's the emotional toddler brain, okay? So the subconscious has issues. That's where your issues live, in case you were wondering. They're in your subconscious. If you don't think you have issues, you have issues. <laughs> Okay, everybody's got them. Nobody's exempt. Anyone who thinks they're exempt has serious issues. So it seems super basic and fundamental, which it is. It is. It's not hard. It's, it's not hard to learn. It's not hard to put something into practice. It's not even hard to do. What the hard part becomes is the wrestling match that you get to have with yourself. I just repeated myself when I said that, which is the hard part. That's the hard part, right? So if I say, when I say it's really, what if it's really, really hard? That's the hard part. So this is where you get to decide how big your huevos are, all right? Which is how much of your own horse garbage, trying to watch my tongue a little bit. Normally I don't, but somehow I feel like I should here. I grew up, I grew up in the church as a kid. This is very church-like to me, so it's a little weird, but it's all right. God, I distracted myself again. What was I talking about? Or shit. Oh, now I just said it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for that. All right. Well, now that glass ceiling's broken. Um, Oh, yeah, oh, your emotional crap. Okay, yeah, 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 all right. So your internal garbage. So here's where you get to see just how much courage and bravery you have. Are you willing to admit what a terrible, horrible, shitty person you are? Are you? Or, or, or are you, I'm fine. I didn't do anything wrong. I'm good. I'm blameless. It wasn't my fault. They did it. It was their fault. They started it. So even some of the most wonderful people I have met in my life, some of the most wonderful people, they got something. Everybody's got something. Everybody does, right? So are you willing to look in the mirror at yourself and be like, oh, man, do I have work to do here? Because if you can't do that, you're going to come to a place, uh, one of a number of what we call psionic dead ends, which means you will go down a road, make some progress or development, and then you will make a dead stop and go no further. No more progress. You will make no more development. You will get no more amplitudes. You will stop right there. Because all of this is happening with your brain and your mind, right? And it turns out all of your issues are one of the things that are clogging up your brain and your mind. So you get to sort that crap out. Here's what I recommend. If you love your family and you love your friends, don't talk to them about your problems. They don't need to hear it. Doesn't mean you shouldn't share with friends and family. 
But if you got problems to talk about, get a therapist. Trust me, get a therapist. Talk to your therapist. Because a good therapist will remind you, in usually a very nice way if they're a good person, of what a terrible, horrible person you are. Probably because your parents were terrible, horrible people. So it's kind of not your fault, but it's your responsibility. Right? It's like your parents help make you a terrible, horrible person because they're terrible, horrible people. End the cycle. Take responsibility. Stop being a horrible person. Now, you may be mostly, mostly a very fine and wonderful person. I'll give you some credit for that. But finding the courage to admit that you're flawed, to admit that you said something that you really shouldn't have said, or done something that you really shouldn't have done, or lied about something that you really shouldn't have lied about. That's the stuff that's going to hold you up. So when you're willing to face that crap, then progress can actually happen. And all of that easy stuff that's not hard to do becomes easier and easier and easier and easier. And all that stuff gets out of your way, clears your energy channels, clears your psyche, clears your brain, so that you can actually develop. So, okay, so let's say it's not just about you being a terrible, horrible person. Uh, chances are, if this room is any kind of a statistical average, that there are over two-thirds of the people in this room that experienced a very horrible, traumatic childhood event. We don't have to talk about them right now. It's okay. But you know what I'm talking about. You know what it is. Maybe you don't talk about it. Maybe you do talk about it. Maybe it's a reason why you're a terrible person. Because you act out. Take it out on other people. People do that. It's not okay. Right? So if you if you do that and you think it was okay because you're like, well, I was mad. I was really just blown off steam. No, it's not okay. Right? Taking accountability for everything you say and everything you do, 24-7, 365, is part of that act of courage of facing who you are. Right, is when you take, take full responsibility. I was really mad, I didn't mean it. Well, if you didn't mean it, why'd you say it? Because there's probably a part of you that really meant it. Right? When we're angry, we say things, I didn't really mean it. Well, yeah, you did. There's a part of you that did, that meant exactly what you said, or you wouldn't have said it. All right, I'm not gonna beat everybody anymore. You're all wonderful people. You're good people. Pat yourselves on the back for being awesome. Okay, there, does that negate that a little bit? All right, cool. So once you sort some crap out, you understand that there's a daily disciplinary process for development and growth, and you decide, I want psionic superpowers. Cool, all right, pick one. Pick one that you want. And then you focus on that one. You start small, you get bigger. There's all kinds of what we would say are rigorous and empirical tests that you can do to demonstrate psionic ability. It's not just something that you have to believe in or say, I believe in it and therefore it worked. Maybe, I'm not gonna criticize. But there are ways to empirically and rigorously test development. Um, for instance, if you were like, uh, I want to be the best remote viewer in the world. All right, well, then you better start practicing every day. And if you're going to do it right, you have to have a person, a third person, prepare a box for you every day with objects in it that they hand to another person that doesn't know what's in the box that they hand to you, that then you have to figure out what's in the box. Otherwise, the person who hands you the box knows what's in the box, and they might tell you what's in the box called rigorous empirical study, shyanch, all right? So there are ways that you can test something so that you can know what you're developing. That you're like, oh, I got one thing in the box. Actually, that's not bad. If you can get one item in a box doing a remote view test, you did all right. But you can track that development. And that development, again, isn't gonna go like this. You might, it might go like this as far as like, I got one object, I got two objects, I got no objects, I got four objects, I got no objects, I got one object, whatever, right? <clears throat> That's development, but you can chart development 
over that course of time because something's happened. So whatever you want to pick to do, you pick that thing and you focus on it every day as a disciplinary practice with some form of feedback that's telling you whether it's working or not. That's how you get development, right? So you establish these processes, which is what I teach my students how to do, obviously. I'm not just telling you, go figure this out. Like this is what I teach my students to do, very, very clear, step by step by step. But it's hours and hours and hours and hours of lecture time. So obviously, I don't have nearly enough time to even try to like do that. So we're just doing really crammed up stuff. But there's a very direct process to that. So once you start that process of development, you're putting time into it. And then you start stacking on other principles and fundamentals, right? That starts to make that amplitude go up so that you're getting more and more amplitude, getting like stronger muscle. And then you're getting to where whatever focus ability, whatever psionic self-mastery you're working on, you get better and better and better. Here's the side effect of that, right? Practice one discipline and get better and better and better at it so your amplitudes go up. Guess what that does? Somebody shout it out. What does that do? Makes everything easier. How about that? Makes everything easier, right? Because your muscles stronger. Anybody go to the gym and you start out and you're like, oh, this is so heavy. And then what happens after a couple of weeks, you're like, this is not so hard, right? I can do this. That's muscle development. And your brain is really like a muscle. <laughs> so that daily development is the same as working out your regular muscles. And I tell people, you won't get stronger sitting on the couch thinking about doing jumping jacks doesn't work that way. You have to get off your ass and actually do the jumping jacks. Same thing with your psionic muscles. <coughs> I got something in my throat. <coughs> Maybe I do. <laughs> I think a bug flew down my throat. <coughs> oh, thank you, sweetheart. <coughs> Sometimes those spiders just jump right in. <coughs> thank you. So you get those amplitudes up. You're building your muscle. Then everything gets easier. So then you can pick another discipline, do something else. And then essentially, this process never ends. If you want to get good at something, you don't ever stop. You do it every day. You put time, energy, focus on it every day. For what purpose? <gasps> to make things easier, to make them less difficult. How about work smarter, not harder, people? Right? So make your brain stronger, make it more powerful, give it a, more of a vessel that can hold a stronger mind. So the mind muscle can work more, so it builds muscle, so it does amplitude, so that you can actually make things happen. And that applies to everything. Anything that is a psionic vibration going out from your brain or your body out into the world to impact anything is directly impl implicated Implicated? That's not the word I wanted to use. Impacted by those amplitudes. So if you want to manifest a car, let's just make something material to make it easy. Because material stuff is so much easier to manifest sometimes. So say you want to manifest a car. If your amplitudes that you're pushing out are under 10 scions per second, it's going to take a minute. And that might not be the car you want. And it might be a lemon because your amplitudes suck. So stronger amplitudes mean you're more likely to get the thing that you're clearly putting energy into. So it's not, again, just about what you're visualizing or what you're focusing on, what you're putting into that. It's those amplitudes behind that. If you're not doing something that's putting those amplitudes behind it, you could waste more time doing something else. You could but you might not want to waste time doing something that's a total waste of time, right? So I would encourage, and this, and I see this all the time, no fault to people, because there's a bunch of people being taught things by teachers who are, nice words, nice words, Randy, say nice words. <laughs> say nice words. Who are doing the best with what they've got. That's a nice way to say it, thank you. They're doing the best with what they've got. Bless their hearts, right? 
I remember when my mom taught me that that was a way that you sort of, you insult someone, but you say it really, really nice, right? You don't want to say it directly, so if you want to just like undercut your, bless their heart. Oh, bless their hearts. They mean well. And it's, and it's bad training that's been passed on for decades. And I, and I find that there's just sort of a, a train of inaccurate, sort of badly thrown together information that people have done the best they can to stick together and try to make something work. No, no fault. But if you want it to actually work, and you want it to actually do something, you don't want to waste your time, then you don't want to waste time with something that feels overly complicated. And this is my other complaint. Most people's operating systems are way overly complicated. Way overly complicated. Like so complicated that you are often overburdening a person's brain with that information by saying, here are 20 things that make this work, when it's like, let's start with the first two things. Start with three things and then work up from there. And so one of the problems that I've noticed is what we call the sort of um, shot in the arm of information that comes in like short, you know, people go to a workshop for a weekend or a couple of days and you get a bunch of information all at once. And they're like, yeah, they get shot in the arm and like, yeah, I'm ready to go and do this. Right? And then three days later, they're like, oh, no, no. oh this is sounding cool. I don't want to feel like it. It also appeals to uh, something I call the 1% success model, which is you throw a bunch of information out at people, and what you're really going to get from that is about 1% of the people who grab that information will be like, ah, I can do something with this. And they run off and they do something with it because they're a brown nose or a student. But not everybody's like that, right? So should we have a higher expectation that people should somehow be better at learning stuff? Or should we attempt to teach people the way that they learn stuff? Well, if you want that 1% success model, eh, it doesn't matter, right? Because you don't care, it's 1%. I kind of want the other thing. I want a 99% success model. I would like 99% of my students to walk away going, I understood it, I got it, I applied it, yay. That's what I would prefer. So it's one of the reasons why we do it in these like steps and why I decided I really resisted doing an online course forever. And I mean like like old school resisted it. So I'm not gonna do it. I want to teach in-person classes. I want to look people in the eye and I want to see them in the room and I want to be able to like, this is what you're doing wrong. So that, because I, I've always felt as a teacher that I get the best results with students that way. And there's no question that my in-person classes, I've had fed fabulous results with the students in those classes. But it's a limited scope, right? I can only put so many people in a class. I can only do so many classes a year. There's all kinds of logistical things. So finally, after getting poked about it forever, someone finally convinced me, thank you, Tim, to get my online course done because I would reach more people. I was excited about that. So, and then I started to think more about it. And I was like, you know, I can do the opposite of what everyone else does with this curriculum, which is instead of go, here's a bunch of information, have fun. Good luck. I can go, you know what? Let's actually be in school for a minute, have a lesson, and then another lesson with some homework, and another lesson with some homework, so that there's an integration process, right? Because again, you're, you're retraining, reprogramming your brain, you're changing behavior patterns with your mind. So, and what I find is that while there are a certain percentage, small percentage of people that can do this hard, fast shock, change their life and eh, be totally differently dynamic, you know, a few days later, most people don't. Most people have to make little changes. So let's work with that. So I feel that so far, this is a better attempt to make sure that everyone absorbs the information. So you got lots of time to like absorb it into your brain, integrate it, apply it, so that at the end of the course, my goal, if you do your homework, 
is that everyone would be able to make demonstrable progress in a psionic discipline of their choice. My three favorites um, that are the e really the easiest to teach are remote viewing techniques, precognition techniques, and telekinesis. So the last three in-person classes I had, I taught the TK technique. I had 100% of my students for three classes who were able to replicate the technique after three days. Oh, I'm sorry, you're not impressed by that? <laughs> oh, I, I'm, I'm sorry. Should we have the other guy up here who teaches people telekinesis? Because I'll go get him if you want. Oh, wait, there isn't one. That's it, I'm the only one, right? I'm the only one, I'm the only one that I know that has taught a, a, a demonstrable, provable technique that everybody could do. I'm the only person I know who does it. I'm not trying to like boast. I'm just saying, I'm the only person I know. If you know someone else, you can go take their class. Have fun with that. So, thank you. So if I, if I can do that, if I, if I can teach students to do that, I can teach them the basics and the fundamentals of where to start, and we can only go up from there, right? So, I don't suck at my job. I'm, I'm okay at it. I've managed to take a curriculum that was a military program and adapt it for civilian people, which basically just means taking out certain things that you're never going to need to know. It's no important for you at all in any way, shape, or form. It's a waste of time if I put it in there. But most of it is fundamentals as distilled down from as many different techniques and disciplines and what we understand about the science of it, what other species taught us about it, and distilled it into fundamentals, right? So operating systems are very specific on certain terminology, certain ways of breathing, certain ways that your energy moves, certain ways that you visualize, or certain ways that you do all these practices. That's called operating system. Operating systems don't matter. They don't matter. Operating systems, I'll tell you why operating systems don't matter. Because operating systems are all made of fundamentals. They're all made of basic building blocks that can be broken down into something that's easier to understand, that's more fundamental, that is essentially the same building blocks that puts everything together. People just call them different things, they name them different things, they describe them slightly differently, they try to give them different properties, but it's the same fundamentals. It's the same fundamentals. You. Oh, sure, go for it. Good question. So the question was, uh, are amplitudes affected by emotions or are emotions amplitudes? The answer is that ampli amplitudes is your psionic output, which is independent of your emotions, but your emotions can certainly increase or decrease amplitudes, right? And have a tremendous effect on that. Um, I try to teach people to detach a lot of their emotional development from those outputs because that puts you on kind of a roller coaster of outputs. And so the more you can detach from that, the more you're not relying on the emotion to make it stronger or having you to go again in a roller coaster of like something that makes it stronger and then hitting a, you know, counter emotion that makes it, you know, drop back down again. So you tend to kind of roller coaster that way. But emotions do definitely affect amplitudes. Absolutely. Let's see. <clears throat> time? Where are we at? Want to tell me what time it is? How long do I have? Ooh, I got more time, huh? Cool. Sweet. If I want? Nope. Nope. I'm not your pony to do tricks. I know. You want to take my class? So I'll teach you how to make a trainer and teach you how to do it. Yeah. So uh, the other reason I don't do tricks is because um, what I actually can do or, or how good or not I can do it is considered classified information. If I would be telling the whole room what I was capable or not capable of or setting some kind of standard, then someone would know something about me that I don't want them to know. I would rather it was mysterious. Keeps them scared. Yeah. So anyway, 
Shoot, what you got there? Brain, brain waves, breathing. Yeah, that's pretty much it. So, I mean, those are the basic fundamentals of where you're starting. And then as far as like the lessons in the class, there's like another 12 different, 15 different things that are what I would call fundamental add-ons that you get to keep adding on to that practice until it gets more and more developed and you're adding, adding more amplitudes. But like I said, that's like really, you know, 15 hours of class time for me to explain all the fundamentals, but they're, again, they're, they're fundamental. They're, they're not hard. Um, they're things that you're like, Oh, why didn't I hear somebody explain it to me that before? And it's like, well, cause they wanted to make it complicated. They didn't want to make it simple, which some people do on purpose. Some people do it on purpose. They're assholes. <laughs> anyway, um, blah, 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 blah. Okay, I could sort of explain some more stuff, but, mm, you know, whatever. Uh, we'll do a workshop on Sunday. Take my workshop, yay, thanks. And so let's do some questions. Sure, what you got? I didn't at all. I didn't say a word. I, pres I presume that if you're in this room, you've heard of me before, but I might be wrong about that. I know, so I, that was an assumption on my part. See, now I'm the asshole. All right, I made an assumption. So, okay, quick show of hands. Who has never heard of me and doesn't know who I am? Oh, shit, that's way more than I thought. So you're Alexander, who is this guy? What is he talking about? What does he know anything about? Who is he? Why should I care? It's like talking like I should care what he's talking about. Who is he? All right, well, I guess I give you a little bit about that. <clears throat> so uh, my name is Captain Randy Kramer, United States Marine Corps Special Section. United States Marine Corps Special Section is the covert military space program arm of the Marine Corps. Um, I spent a 30 year tour uh, in covert military space program activities. And when I say 30 year tour, that's an off world tour. So there's very, very little that happens on world when you get on a tour. So I spent about a little over 17 years in the infantry uh, in a little outfit called the MDF, which stands for the Mars Defense Force, which has been sort of guarding the perimeter of the colony since 1975. If you didn't know there were colonies on Mars, they've been there since 1975. Surprise. Don't let it throw you off. Um, so, so I did that for like 17 years and then clawed my way up to uh, Sergeant Major and then got the best thing in the world that anybody could have ever given me, which is the opportunity to go to flight school. So I got an officer's commission, I got to go to flight school, and I spent the remainder of my career as a pilot for, well, I did, I was just a pilot for about three, four years. And then because I had so much infantry experience, they were like, oh, you should really be on the special forces team, which is basically pilots who had infantry experience, and it was uh, rapid insertion, high value target, termination, or extraction. So we get a picture and a location and it will either there to kill you or bring you home safely. So depending on which list you're on. So I did that and pretty much to the end of my career. And then this is where it gets weird as if that wasn't the weird part, right? So for those of you have, so those of you heard this story, you know what's happened next, right? So for those of you who haven't, so at the end of a tour of duty, standard practice and procedure for several decades has been to take the soldier in question, return them to a little place called Luna Operations Command, which is the sort of headquarters on the back of the moon. And you go through a process which they call age reversing and mind wipe, it's neither. So the mind wipe is not a wipe, it's a, it's a comp compartmentalization or suppression of memory. So they wanna take all the classified information that you just did for however many decades that was your tour and compartmentalize it in separate so that you don't remember anything, you can't divulge secrets and tell people stuff. What's that, I'm sorry? Oh, because that's where the big base is, where the big medical center is on the backside of the Moon at Loan Operations Command. So that's where essentially covert military space program headquarters is. So it's 
right there. So everything is centralized there. They have this major medical center there that you do all the procedures and stuff for. So they do a mental suppression, do a mental compartmentalization. And then age reversing, again, is also nothing of the kind. They actually crack out a fresh clone of your body and then pull out everything of you that's alive and conscious and stick it into another vessel. Just like, and you get a fresh body. And then they return you 15 minutes after you left. So it's as if you were never gone. Yeah. Now I can remember the morning after of waking up, right? And so I wake up from that. I literally can remember enough that I'm like, whoa, that was the longest dream ever. That went on for months and months and months. And I was in all kinds of weird places doing weird things. And then, oh, it's gone. No, oh, all right, well, got to get to go to school. So I was 17 again, right? So I had to go finish high school. So, and then the process of regaining memory. Uh, I would say that over the process of the, the first 10 years of that process, it was bits and pieces, flashes, little segments, shit that didn't make sense. There was no chronological order to it. There was no sense of like, how did that happen? When did that, where, how could that have occurred? Where was this happening? But about the time I hit about 27 or 28 years old, I met a very wise person who um, I was sort of explaining what was happening. I was like, I don't know, this is really confusing. I don't know, maybe I'm just losing my mind and I'm batshit crazy. You know, I'm willing to consider the possibility. And he said, I don't think that's what's going on. He said, I'm not going to tell you how to sort this out, but he said, I think you may need to remember things. And he said that, and it got a little goosebumps, and I was like, oh, maybe I do need to remember something. And so I started doing what I consider a very conscious effort of meditating, going into theta states down in my subconscious brain and going, looking around, going, okay, where is it? Where are these memories? Where's the stuff? Following threads, usually of horrible traumatic events that I didn't want to remember, but those are the things that have the strongest connection to them. So probably the first like really vivid full sensory memory recollections that I had were of some of the worst things that had ever occurred that I ever probably could have experienced in my life. So it was a little shocking, a little terrifying, a little horrifying. Um, got to re-experience all the trauma, uh, all my friends dying, my first wife taking a bullet to the head for me, a whole bunch of crap like that. Um, got to re-grieve her death. That was fun. That's a fun thing to do twice if you've never done it before. I fully encourage you to do it. So let someone really close to you die, grieve really bad for it, and then go get your memory repressed. So you have to remember it again, and then you can re-grieve all over again. It's really fun. I'm kidding. It's not. It sucks. I was a little mad about that, to be honest with you. I was a little ticked off that some of the things that I had to sort out were um, really crappy. Because I felt like, to be honest, I'd sorted this out once already. I did this already. I processed it already. And then you made me have to do it again. No, oh, man. I was not happy about that. Uh, but I would say probably about 10 years after that of what I would call a really, really vigorous, diligent process of digging into that subconscious to pull all this crap out, I finally got what I would call about 90% total recall. And I was, at that point, I was like, all right, now this makes sense. I didn't, I didn't like it. Can I be really honest about that? Like, I didn't like it at all. I didn't like looking at everything that I had to remember and going, hey, this is cool. No, I was not happy at all. I was like, this sucks. I don't want to do this. This is crappy. But that's also part of the healing process, right? It, it, there was a point where I really got over it. And then it no longer bothered me. And I was like, oh, I've actually had the coolest freaking life ever. I have been places you have never been. I have seen things you've never seen. Talked to people you've never talked to. Walked on the surface of planets that I guarantee you will never walk on. Not because you'll never have the opportunity to travel in space, but these are places, as a civilian, you will never get to go. Ever. I got to go there. I can't tell you. First rule of Fight Club is you don't talk about Fight Club. 
So there's some things I can talk about, obviously. And there are some things that I, you know, can't. I can also go to stories, right, 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 right. But I've had the best life ever. Ever. Ever, 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 ever. Ever. I've got to go places, do things, play with the coolest toys ever. Multi-million dollar toys that blow things up and rip things apart. Things that give you super strong hydraulic muscles and you can punch holes through people and stuff like that. Really cool stuff. I'm sorry, as a Marine, that stuff cool to me. Maybe it's not cool to you. I think destroying things is fun. It's because I'm a Marine. I was trained, conditioned, programmed to love to kill and destroy things. It's my happy place. Funny story. Ex-girlfriend... Um, Every morning we would wake up and she would always say, what did you dream about last night? She always wanted to share what we dreamed about. And what started to find a pattern, not that we dreamt about the same things or the same places, but that there were same similar themes. So sometimes if she would have a really hard, you know, difficult emotional dream dealing with, you know, some things like I might have something in my own things like, oh, I had a thing that was about this. So one morning, she wakes up and she's very excited. She's like, what did you dream about last night? I was like, you tell me first. And she's like, it was the best thing ever. I was in my happy place. I was in the ocean swimming with the dolphins. She's actually got to swim with pods of dolphins in Hawaii. It's very cool. She's done that for real. It's like, I got to swim with the dolphins. I was in the ocean. And it was the coolest thing ever. I was in my happy place. What did you dream about? Um, well, I was in a deep, dark dungeon, and there were goblins everywhere, hordes and hordes of goblins coming from all directions, hundreds of them, crawling on the walls and the ceilings, and I looked down on the floor, and there were two swords, and I went, dual wielding, and I killed goblins all night long. It was awesome. It was my happy place. I couldn't have been happier. Ah, kill them all night long. It's my happy place. I'm okay with that. I used to not be okay with that. I'm okay with that now. So everybody's got a different happy place. Marines, their happy place is stomping on things, killing things, blowing stuff up. Luckily, there turns out to be a whole, like, long list of people who need a can of whoop ass popped open on them out in the universe out there. So we have this thing called the 95-5 rule. The 95-5 rule is a rule until some other math shows that it's different. And the 95-5 rule is about 95% of all species that we run into. We won't say that they're our best friends, but we will say that they would rather have a conversation, rather trade than anything else. Nice people, for the most part. Sort of. Sorta, sorta. Let's be clear that some of those people are not people you want to spend a lot of time with, probably wouldn't want to date them. But they would rather talk and trade than do anything else. 5% are the assholes who don't want to talk and don't want to trade. They're scavengers and slavers and traffickers and pirates and all kinds of other things that need an ass whooping. So luckily, we can take all of that focus of ass whooping on things and we can stop doing it to each other here. So let me be perfectly clear, and I'll talk more about this tomorrow. One of the main goals of covert, covert military space program office senior officers is to end all war on planet Earth so we can focus it everywhere else. Oh, totally. Yeah, we're good. Oh, we're so good at it. Oh my gosh, we are mad, crazy monkeys. Terrifying. We're terrifying. I'm telling you. There are people who are absolutely terrified of us because we're crazy little monkeys. And we build stuff really good, like better than other people do. So there are species who are flying around in the same ass Model T that they've been flying around for 5,000 years. Why change it? Works just fine. 
Have you ever known a person on this planet to build something and then be like, that's good. I don't ever need to change that. It's totally good. No. Five minutes after it's done, you're going, okay, next one. I'm going to put a double overhead cams on it. I'm going to put bigger tires. I'm going to make flames on the side. and Make it more aerodynamic, right? You're immediately thinking about how to make it better. That's not as common as you might think. Turns out it's fairly uncommon. Not totally like doesn't happen, but it's more of a tiny percentage of species who have that creative inspiration than don't. So we have that. So it turns out in the last 70, 80 years, we have taken the, tech, the basic fundamentals of extraterrestrial technology that we have as far as propulsion systems, energy generation, different sort of weapons development technology, and we have run like crazy with it. We have put more time, more money, more brain power into that for decades. And I'm telling you, we've made significant progress. Significant progress. So that's the good news because the, the more we get focused, one second, the more we get focused out there, the less we have to punch and kick each other down here. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. So here's an important fundamental though for those of you who think. But Randy, why can we not just be at peace with each other? That's a very simple answer. Because some people don't want it. They're never going to want it. They're never going to want to be peaceful. They're never going to want to be nice. They're never going to want to be friendly. They're never going to want to be fair. They're never going to want to listen to you say, dude, back off. You can be like, well, make me. And you might have to make them. So one of the things that I find is very interesting is for decades, is we have encountered other species who come along and we've you know, had these different negotiations. Common theme is they love to high road us. It's like, uh, you humans are too violent and too aggressive. You should be more peaceful like us. Until we met a few of the other galaxies warrior species. Their opinion was a little bit different. We don't think you're dumb. We don't think you're too aggressive. We don't think you're too violent. We think you're smart and have adult level responsibility because you don't want someone else to come clean up your mess for you, solve your problems, protect you because you would rather do that yourself because you would rather be self-determined because you would rather make sure that there's no one else that can tell you what to do and that you don't have to call the phone and ask someone else to come save your butt. That's actually more adult level responsibility than these other pussies, okay? So the next time someone tries to tell you as a human, you're too violent, you're too aggressive, and you need to be more peaceful, you can tell them to suck your left nut. <laughs> because we're, that's where we're supposed to be. We are a warrior species. One of two things is gonna happen with that. We're not undoing it. We're not going backwards. We're not going to all of a sudden be a peaceful, loving society. Maybe in a couple thousand years, we can work it out. Maybe. But it's not going to happen that we're just going to undo it. So we have two choices. We can do it well, or we can do it really bad. Any pick? Well, I'd rather do it well than bad, right? I'd much rather do it well than bad. So that means embracing it. That means accepting it. And that means having standards. That means you have rules, you have regulations. I mean, our, our military works better than other people's militaries because we have rules, because we have guidelines, because we have boundaries. And when you step outside those lines and boundaries, there's disciplinary action for it. The better we are at that, the better our soldiers behave, the better our officers behave, the more likely then that we have an honorable military that does what it's supposed to do out there and then we down here can have other cool stuff, like spaceships, flying cars. Anyone want a flying car? I want a flying car. A jetpack? I want a jetpack. Rocket boots? I want rocket boots. Anti-gravity belt? I want an anti-gravity belt. Invisibility helmet? Well, whatever, right? I mean, there's all kinds of cool stuff that we can have, right? So instead of fighting amongst ourselves, we can have that, everything can go awesome, and then we can turn all of our warrior aggressive energies out there. Which I'll say one last thing about. Again, we've made significant progress. 
over the decade, over the last seven or eight decades. So, and again, we make really good stuff. So it turns out our manufacturing is also really, really tight. So we make better plasma rifles, better body armor, better spaceships than just about anybody else, which means people want to buy our stuff. So they come to us. It also means that if someone ends up in a conflict with someone and they don't really have the capacity to solve it themselves, we're like, um, hey, can you guys come help out? And then we'll look at whatever trade agreements we have with them and go, oh yeah, we don't want to lose that stuff. We better go make sure we get to keep that stuff. 